Today's episode of NCIX Tech Tips is going to be covering the topic of bottlenecking. So this is an example of a bottleneck. Bottleneck. You can see here in my crudely drawn illustration, I have two lanes of traffic moving side by side. And then all of a sudden, one of the lane ends and it becomes one lane. So this truck is going to have to find a way to kind of like wedge himself in there and this car is going to have to merge and basically everyone has to slow down. Whenever there's a bottleneck, it can only go as fast as the narrowest part of the road. So the reason it's called a bottleneck is because it looks an awful lot like the neck of a bottle. So that's my cork on the top, that's the bottom of the bottle. Here is your bottleneck. Now we're going to talk about how this applies to computer components when you're designing a new system or when you're upgrading your existing system to avoid situations where one component or a couple of components cause a bottleneck where the system can't perform to its full potential. So when can bottlenecking be a problem? As I mentioned in the previous shot, when you're configuring a new system. Now I'm going to give you a few specific examples of bottlenecks that I've seen over the years when people are configuring a brand new PC. I have some components in front of me that I'm going to use to illustrate some of these points, but let's run down a few of the basics first. Let's say, for example, you're putting together a basic uh, web browsing machine for your grandma and you put in a thousand watt power supply. That is a bottleneck. The 1000 watt power supply does not in any way contribute to that system performing any better. It doesn't help. You could perform just as well with a 300 watt power supply. So essentially that system is bottlenecking the overall performance the power supply is capable of delivering. Now let's say you're building a gaming machine. If you want to build a gaming machine, you need to find balanced components so that we can have two lanes that are able to move at the same speed, meaning the CPU and the graphics card. I see lots of people configuring a gaming system where they take the cheapest possible CPU, like a $100 CPU, and they tack a $400 graphics card to it, a $500 graphics card. That graphics card is not going to perform to its full potential because it's going to be held back by the CPU and vice versa. You can't build a great gaming machine with a thousand dollar extreme edition CPU and then a mid-range, you know, $150 graphics card. That extreme edition CPU is capable of so much more. The other main example of when bottlenecking can be a big problem is when you're upgrading an older system. I get a ton of emails about this. Linus, I'm running a Celeron this or that with one gig of RAM and I want to get a new graphics card, would you recommend the Radeon 5870? The answer is no, because your CPU and your RAM and probably most of your system, power supply, everything else, is going to seriously hold back that card. Now you could upgrade, of course you can. You can upgrade to something within reason, but you're going to be introducing bottlenecks when you take two components that are completely mismatched in terms of their class and put them together. So a great example would be putting in a new CPU to update your machine, but leaving in your ancient old hard drive. Let's say you got like an old 5400 RPM hard drive and you upgrade your motherboard and your CPU and your RAM, you put in a whole new system basically, and you leave in that ancient drive. You're not going to get the best performance out of it. Another great example is upgrading the computer in a way that's not going to help you achieve your goals. Like let's say you want better video rendering performance and you go ahead and throw a bunch of money at a new video card and a new motherboard and new RAM and you leave the old CPU. That old CPU is still the bottleneck for that particular application. So for today's practical demonstration of bottlenecking, and I wish I could run all these benchmarks in front of you, but I can't because it would take too long. I am going to talk about this particular platform versus this particular platform. And I'm holding these motherboards up. Okay, so the first one I have here, this orange one, I'm going to call it the orange one, is a DFI LAN Party X38 motherboard. So it's a last generation product, or even a couple generations ago now. It has a Core 2 Duo, it's a low clocked Core 2 Duo, a 1.8 gigahertz Core 2 Duo with 4 gigs of RAM. Okay, so it's a fairly low end platform from last generation. And the one I have here, well, this is pretty much state of the art. It's not a six core, but it is a quad core. This is a Core i7-875K. It is overclocked to 3.8 gigahertz, and this represents the other end of the spectrum. So these are going to be my potentially bottleneck CPU and my not bottleneck CPU down here. Now the graphics cards I have are both modern generation cards. This is a GTS 450 Cyclone from MSI. It is a mid-range performance card. And then the other one I have here, well this is the GTX 480. This is the big dog. This is NVIDIA's 
fastest performing single GPU product on the market. So I might say, OK, well, based on the lesson we've had so far, which of these would you pair with which CPU and motherboard platform? The obvious answer should be like this. But we're going to show you a practical demonstration in a graph form, or maybe I'll just say it out loud, of what happens if you do run a completely mismatched GPU with a CPU. So I ran the Crisis GPU benchmark. I'm running at 1680 by 1050 with pretty much medium settings because I didn't want to overstress the CPU part of it or overstress the GPU aspect. So when I took my GTX 480 and I ran it with my old uh, Core 2 Duo, I got a total average FPS, and I'm going to totally cheat and look down here, sorry guys, but I got a total average FPS of about 30 frames per second. Okay? So when I went and I downgraded to the old GTS 450, I got a total of 28.8 frames per second. Do you think there's more than a 1 FPS difference in performance between these two cards? If you think so, the answer is correct. But what we have experienced here is a CPU bottleneck. This CPU is not capable of taking advantage of anything higher end than a GTS 450, and this is obvious based on the game benchmarks that we ran. So then I go and throw those same two graphics cards into the Core i7, clocked at 3.8 gigahertz with 4 gigs of DDR3 RAM, etc., etc. All of a sudden, even the GTS 450 skyrockets up to 67 frames per second at exactly the same settings. All we've done basically is upgrade the CPU because the DDR2 and DDR3 factor uh, of difference is very little. So we've upgraded the CPU, boom, we get huge performance increase. And then we go ahead and throw in the GTX 480, now we're getting 97 frames per second. So as soon as you put in a CPU that is able to provide everything that this high-end GPU needs, well, we see it really stretch its wings. But here's something to note. If we turned up the graphical settings way up, and that's why people say when you have a high-end graphics card, you should turn your graphics settings way up, we're going to see a bigger difference between these two cards. What we've gone ahead and introduced is actually yet another CPU bottleneck by not turning up our graphics settings enough. So you can see that it's a fine balancing act between the right CPU, the right graphics card, and the right graphical settings for your game. One more quick bottlenecking concept is going to be the idea of a bottleneck within a single product. So you see lots of graphics cards on the market. You see GTX 480s and 470s and 465s and 460s and 450s and ah, it's overwhelming, right? So what a lot of entry-level consumers who don't do their research might assume is uh, more graphics card memory is better. It's a perfect example of a bottleneck that's built right into a product just so that hopefully you'll think it's better. You see lots of high-end graphics cards like a GTX 460 is a great graphics card. It has one gig of memory. You can also buy a completely entry-level graphics card for around 60 bucks that has one gig of memory. Guess which one's going to completely like smack the other one around in the benchmarks and in games. Well, the GTX 460 is going to be a much better card. So that's an example of building in way too much memory that a low-end GPU, which is basically the processor, can't even use. There's an internal bottleneck. Yet another one would be, a, a great example would be the X48 platform, where it supported DDR3, but really the Core 2 Duo had no use for the bandwidth that DDR3 provided. So there was no performance difference between buying a DDR3 version of an X48 versus the DDR2 version. You just paid extra. So there's another example of a built-in bottleneck. Now I've spent a lot of time on scaremongering about bottlenecks. Oh no, you're going to buy a new graphics card. You're not going to be able to take advantage of it at all. But there are solutions. So how do you avoid bottlenecks? One of the ways, if you're building a new system or if you're upgrading, is to plan smart. Buy components that go together. So you don't buy a $1,000 CPU and then a $50 hard drive. You know, you buy a $500 CPU, you buy a nice SSD drive for a couple hundred bucks, you buy a nice $300 graphics card, all of a sudden you've got a balanced system. So that's important. You want to build with balance. Another thing is to also build towards what you want to do. So if your system's going to be all about intensive number crunching, you know what? Cheap out on your GPU. It's fine. Who cares if your GPU bottlenecks it? Because data crunching, depending what you're doing, as long as you're doing something CPU intensive, is not going to 
even let the GPU factor into it. It's all going to be CPU driven. Another example is gaming. For gaming, you need a decent CPU, but you're going to get to a point where the CPU doesn't make an impact because the CPU is capable of driving the in-game AI, the physics, all of that stuff. It's capable of it already, so there's no extra CPU needed. And then it comes down to the graphics card muscle being there to drive up the detail levels, increase the anti-aliasing, all that good stuff. So the second tip is build around what you're actually trying to do with your system. And the last one is get advice. So one of the ways that I would get advice is ask a professional. You can actually contact PC at NCIX.com. NCIX is, of course, the uh, sponsor for NCIX Tech Tips, believe it or not. And the PC advisor can easily tell you, hey, you're going to upgrade something? Well, this would be the best choice. Or you're going to build a new system? These components go really well together. You don't have to figure it out all on your own. But if you do want to figure it out all on your own, you can, of course, read endless benchmark sites and all that stuff. I mean, that's what I do. If if you have fun doing it, great. If not, you can always get advice about how to build a system that will avoid bottlenecking. <laughs>